A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a way that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brothers. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be performed by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. And some sided with the Jews, while others with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to treat them abusively and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Laconia, Lystra, and Derb, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystra, a man was sitting whose feet were incapacitated. He had been disabled from his mother's womb and had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke. Paul looked at him intently and saw that he had faith to be made well. And he said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And the man leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that Paul saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Laconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes, since he was the chief speaker. Moreover, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard about it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of the same nature as you, preaching the gospel to you to turn from these useless things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. In past generations, he permitted all nations to go their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And even by saying these things, only with difficulty did they restrain the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the clouds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking that he was dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derb. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made a good number of disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, It is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they entrusted them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia and came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been entrusted to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. 
and they spent a long time with the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, Let's open up in prayer, and then we'll get started. Uh, Lord, we thank you for gathering us here today, allowing us by your grace to hear your word, uh, to worship you, to fellowship together, to get filled with your Holy Spirit, uh, and then to go out in the week to do your work. We thank you through Jesus Christ. Amen. So, we are continuing in the book of Acts. Uh, I always, when, when Greg gets up here and speaks, I'm like, if I've got 30 minutes, I can do the whole thing. I can just cut it down. But if it goes so long, i got 15 minutes, I can cut one point out. It's only real two points. Uh, and that's fine, because the two points are over and over and over throughout the book of Acts, uh, as we see Paul's missionary journeys. And so, um, this morning... Uh, The title I put on there is Paul's Church Planning Modus Operandi. Modus Operandi just means the uh, uh, mode of operating. And so Greg has an old teaching kind of titled the same thing uh, with different points. But we want to look at and see how is Paul planting churches? What is he doing? Especially with a backdrop of Paul knows and all the Christians know, number one, that Jerusalem is going to fall. That the temple is going to be destroyed and that the new covenant is coming with the destruction of the temple. Um, and essentially the Jewish order, and secondly, that Rome is going to fall, and I think they have a much um, uh, a less clear view of when that's going to happen. Uh, Jesus predicted or prophesied in Matthew um, twenty three twenty four about the destruction of the temple, and that was going to happen within forty years, and it did. And so, as we're going through the book of Acts, Jesus is is telling us if you. Um, Remember, we're t- kind of taking Acts 1-8 uh, as kind of our, our theme verse for the, for the book. But you will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so when Peter's preaching in Acts 3, he's saying, <clears throat> the third verse there on your outline is that, uh, calling people towards repentance and that times of refreshing may come when the presence from the presence of the Lord, that he may send Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive. And that happened when Jesus ascended into heaven at the end of all the Gospels. And at the beginning of Acts, he ascended into heaven. So whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his, his holy prophets long ago. And so that's the time that Paul's in in the beginning of Acts, and that's the time that we're in now is the restoration of all things. And so when we looked in uh, a couple weeks ago in Acts chapter 13, um, the goal of Christian communities is to plant more Christian communities. The goal of churches is to plant more churches. That should be a major theme, a major goal of every church. And that's what Paul and and Barnabas have set out to do, and that's what all the apostles were doing. (coughs) And so that really can't be overstated too much that through the cycle we look through in the book of Acts, where people are getting filled with the Holy Spirit, there's preaching, they're making disciples, evangelism, and there's opposition and persecution, then they get filled with the Holy Spirit, and then there's more preaching, evangelism, making disciples, you know, and it goes so on, is that this was the, the major idea that the Christians were thinking of what the restoration of all things is. The key component was building Christian communities that will last. And so, as I've kind of stated in, in subsequent uh, chapters, is we have, in chapter 14, we have a long um, narrative of uh, an account of Paul healing, you know, a man that was lame from birth. Um, but we want to look at what is going on around that. And so we oftentimes, in the Acts, we get like three or four sentences or a small paragraph of what's going on in the Christian community, like they're praying, they're worshiping, they're fasting, uh, and then we get a long account of a miraculous thing that happens, and then another small account of what else is going on in the community. And so I think it's, it is, it's important to note of what is going on in the community and what's going around, going on around these events on how God's building community. So really, what we're going to focus on today is the, the goal of, of churches is to be self-sustainable and the only other point I really want to make is throughout this chapter is that as you grow, as Christian communities grow, as churches grow, they're going to see opposition, and that is God's sovereignly ordained means of more growth. 
And so if you look at verses 1 through 7, um, it pretty much outlines it of what's going on in that, in that cycle. Paul has left uh, Antioch in Pisidia, Paul and Barnabas and, his, and their team, and they're now in Iconium. They enter the Jewish synagogue, as was their pattern. Um, what's interesting is Paul just said, like, hey, I'm not going to the Jews anymore. We're going to the Gentiles. Let's go to Iconium, and let's go to the synagogue where the Jews are, <laughs> Right? So he's, he's making it very clear, and in, in when Paul is, is converted by Christ on the road to Damascus, it's very clear that he's going to be God's mouthpiece or God's uh, apostle to the Gentiles. So why does he say that and still go to the synagogues? Well, one of those reasons is because these people already know the scriptures, they're already pre-evangelized, and the synagogue was also a uh, kind of cultural hotspot if you will, because he's preaching at the synagogue and there's many Gentiles, God-fearing, uh, non-Jewish natives who are there, mm-hmm. right? And so just because he says he's going to the Gentiles, that doesn't mean he's not going to the synagogue. That'd be like me saying, uh, I'm going to go, I'm leaving the Christians and I'm going to go preach to, uh, the, to someone else and then I'm going to show up in a church and I'm not preaching to Christians, I'm preaching to the other people there that, that aren't Christians, that's kind of what he's um, kind of what he's getting at. Is there was obviously large amounts of Jews; they were in control of the synagogue, and the model that he's taking in, in church planning, God never starts and just wipes everything out and starts over. He's always starting with the remnant or the last, the pattern. And even though uh, the Jews had the pattern of the synagogue that uh, started at least 450 years prior, where it got popular with the Roman colonies, where it was a way for Jewish culture to, to spread out over the world, over um, where you didn't have to travel to Jerusalem, you know, every three times a year and uh, uh, to be in the Jewish communities. And so that model that God had already established, Paul's doing the same thing. And so, because God's not in the business of everything he had said and, and prophesied and talked about and, and taught, and then just, it's not working out, so scrap it and do something completely different. Uh, Paul and, and Barnabas and the rest of the apostles are using that model that God had already established. And so he's preaching in the synagogues again, and Jews and, and Greeks are, are believing. And then in verse 2, uh, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained there for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And so when the attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, uh, they fled. They fled the persecution to Lystra, uh, Derb, cities in Lyconia, to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel again. And so we get the long account of, of uh, God's miraculous hand working through Paul. And then if you look on, we printed out maps uh, this week. And if you look at where Derb is, if Paul was just doing what we call our modern missionary, kind of the things we do today, and if he just wanted to preach the gospel, get people converted to Christ, receive Jesus in their hearts, and then get the heck out of there, he could have just traveled to Derb, from Derb uh, to, um, to Tarsus and then go back to, to Antioch. He, it would have been much easier for him to travel back home, his home church at Antioch in Syria, from there. But he doesn't. That's not what the team, that's not what they're doing. That's not their plan. That's not their mission. And so from there, they just go back to every city that they just traveled to. They strengthen the brothers and sisters in Christ, and they appoint elders in each church and eventually make it back. Uh, they, do, they do skip Cyprus. Uh, I'm still not sure why, but <laughs> that was the first place they went to get to uh, the region they're in now. But, and then they make their way back to to Antioch. And so um, the main, what they're, what they're doing is making sure that each church is self-sustainable with, uh, with elders, with teaching, um, and so forth. And so one of the things that we've missed in, in the last 100, 150 years is having a missions movement that is primarily focused on church planting that is self-sustainable. And so he's, I think Paul and Barnabas uh, that we see throughout this and all the apostles are very concerned with getting individual, individual churches to a point of self-sustainability. 
And so I believe that's mainly in their government teaching and in their economy. Again, because I don't think they knew exactly when Rome would fall, but they knew that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And they had to build communities that were going to last for centuries. They had to build and in such a way that when they die, the people that take over, that it doesn't just disband. Right? That's what they thought would happen uh, when they crucified Christ, that, well, now he's dead. This Christian thing is, is going to scatter. They're going to be over. But well, it didn't really work out that way. And so especially in the church's government, teaching, and economy. And so with those things, self-sustainable, you would expect growth to happen after that. Um, I think that would be a very natural thing. And so in the writer of Hebrews tells us towards the end, I think in chapter 10, that, that God, what God does from time to time is he brings about a shaking of different systems and, and ethics and, and whatnot that, so that, that what can be shaken will be removed and that which can't be shaken will remain. And so um, we've had a lot of success in, in America in the last, you know, since we were founded. Um, largely since, since America was founded. And the West, and especially in America, has been the main proponent of foreign missions over the last 100, 150 years, which was really a new thing to operate missions as more of a, of a business and from this part of the world to send missions to another part of the world where they still rely on, on the American economy and, and the government and the board that directs them from the states and, and from... Uh, and from us sending teachers and, and missionaries over. And so we're kind of in a period of time where that, that is getting shaken up. Um, I don't remember the exact figures, but it was the, just this last week I read that as inflation in the, in the economy in America is taking a hit, it was something like about 30% of missions overseas, I think it was particularly in, uh, in India and in the East, has declined, which means when... If we have that model as a business where the, they're not self-sustained, they don't have their own leaders, they don't have their own teachers, they're not, they're not providing their own funds, then when we're hit, they're hit, right? That means if, if we fall, everything else falls. And so that's not God's you know, ultimate plan. That's not God's plan for sustainability uh, or growth. And so when Paul's traveling around, the first thing he does is, is say, who's in charge, Right? Like if you were to uh, go into a store and you needed, you know, something happens and you need to talk to a uh, supervisor or, or whatever, you're asking about like who's in charge, who's, who's running this joint, right? That's what Paul's doing. He's establishing leadership and government in the church, which were raised from the inside out. Paul never planned on staying there and being the apostle that governed the entire church from you know, by traveling, and I'll come back and check on you in three months, and I'll tell you guys what to do. And uh, he expected for leaders and their government to be raised from the, from the ground up. So uh, if you were to look at the qualifications in Timothy 1 and, and 1 Timothy 3, most of those are largely character traits, right? Most of those are, are who do we imitate? How, who do we follow? They first had to have their, uh, their character in order. Right, um, and then the second part of teaching, which is one of the character traits that are in, in both those qualifications, right? That each church was to have its own personal teachers to exhort uh, and expound the gospel. Right. Um, well, real quick, going back to the government, um, not only were they supposed to lead by example, but if you if you remember in First Corinthians six, where Paul's uh, kind of condemning them for like, don't you guys have anybody in your in your own midst in your own community that can handle these things? Why are you going to the pagan courts, right? Why can't you guys handle this, you know, from the inside? Don't you have anybody wise enough, right? And so there's supposed to be some government, government, you know, some governments from inside the church. And so their teachers were supposed to be raised from the inside, right? And so has anybody ever, um, pretty much the megachurch movement has come to a crashing halt, here in the West, uh, but which has, you know, sovereignly happened over the last couple of years where, you, you know, COVID, they won't let you go to church and, uh, or whatever. And so has anybody ever heard of a, of a campus that just shows a video 
of their pastor, but their pastor was like 50 miles away, and they recorded it last week. Right? It's a little, it's a little disconnected. That's how far, that's how far down at least we in the West have come to where, you know, this business model, this non-community, this individualistic, this, the whole megachurch movement has produced it. It came to that, where you watch a pastor that recorded a message, you know, uh, two weeks ago, and you get to view it on your TV, you get to come to church and watch him on TV. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it's live, and, or whatever, right? That's not the way, that's not what Paul's, you know, doing here. That's not sustainable, that's not how uh, uh, it, it removes the bound, you know, it removes the, uh, the closeness, the community aspect, and it really removes what a, what a teacher, what a leader is supposed to be in a community, right, which is you have to know them. You have to be able to imitate them. They have to be able to talk to you, right? Um, and so that means, especially within government and in teaching, that means the next people who will be leaders and teachers are here, right? That means they're or they're at home sick, <laughs> you know. Uh, that means that we strive to raise people up from the inside out. And so um, the third point on the economy, that each church was supposed to be self-sustainable in their own economy, um, that each church was to collect a tithe for its own sustainability. And so think about 1 Timothy 5, especially in Paul's pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy and in Titus. These are how Paul was commending Timothy and Titus, who he was sending as elders, as temporary elders of churches to establish, number one, more elders to get right doctrine and right teaching, give them somebody to follow their example, to raise up leaders. And then a large portion of that, especially in 1 Timothy, was about their own kind of economic sustainability, that they were supposed to give money. There was supposed to be a tie. They were supposed to give money to their and watch out for their own widows, their own poor. Uh, there wasn't supposed to be, you know, a large sum of money coming from the outside, right? There's a few examples that 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 goes off the tracks. Like the church in Jerusalem was so poor and so impoverished uh, that people were sending money to Jerusalem, but that's kind of a a one-off. And so. What self-sustainable, the problem we have with self-sustainability is it takes a lot of time. It is very hard. Okay? And so when we plant churches in India or if we plant a church in Columbus or wherever, as we grow, that means that there's a lot of easier ways to do it. There's a lot of easier ways uh, to, to get growth, to get um, you know, those things or to implant other ideas. Uh, what we're after is what can't be shaken, right? When we plant churches, when we plant other Christian communities, we're planting them in areas that we want them to be self-sustainable. We want them to have their own government, their own teachers, uh, be able to provide for themselves, right? Without the reliability of, of outside sources or, or, um, or a base church for a large portion of that. And so that takes way longer to raise people up from the inside out for them to have the character to have good teaching right one of those qualifications in in the qualifications for elders in Titus 1 is that they can teach healthy doctrine right one of the um what Paul was directly up against in Iconium and traveling back to all these cities was that what were the Jews doing they were stirring up the other people's minds to be against the apostles, right? And so uh, there had to be teachers that had could teach healthy doctrine from the inside out that were going to work with the people on, on you know, a day-to-day basis. That takes a lot longer than just sending somebody in, sending money in, telling them what to do, and then, and then getting out, right? It takes a lot longer, and it's way harder. And so... Uh, what Paul faces here is in any growing Christian community, there's going, to, there's going to be opposition, which is usually a catapult to growth. And so particularly here, um, in says it in the last chapter 2 in 13, uh, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what, Paul, what was spoken by Paul. And then when they flee to Iconium, same thing happens. The Jews don't like it, so the, what's their first line of defense is they try to just argue against them. And so it's almost always the first attack is a verbal attack. 
against the leaders, against their doctrine, uh, in, in any way they can. It always starts with a verbal attack. Um, you know, if, if Paul and Barnabas were loner Christians that were just like here to preach the gospel, get people to accept Jesus in the heart and move to the next city, they wouldn't really care, right? Because they're just people preaching on the streets or they'd be like, please get out of my synagogue and go talk to somebody else, right? But since they were setting up communities, the Jews took a huge offense to this. And so usually when God's, usually God's mode of, of causing growth in an individual or in a community means there's going to be opposition. Just like when you work out, you're not going to get stronger, you're not going to get bigger, you're not going to, um, even working out to heal from an injury without any pain, without doing hard things, without any opposition, right? It's usually the way to, towards growth is, is through the opposition. And so Paul and Barnabas, when they, uh, when you read here in chapter 14 is when they start stirring up opposition, they're, so their next plan is, well, we're going to stay here for a while and argue with them, right? And so, um, again, that, that uh, qualification for elders in Titus is, is chapter 1, 9 through 11. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. That's what an elder does. He rebukes people. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big calling, right? Because he qualifies that, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. This is exactly what Paul was up against. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. And so you can see this, in, especially in the pastoral letters to Timothy and Titus, that a major... A major idea in, in Paul's raising of elders and leaders is to combat arguments, to teach healthy doctrine, to lead people in the right direction. Um, because Paul knows the schemes of the devil, which were, number one, to question God's word, to deceive the people, to get them to think, well, it's not that far off base. And, you know, it's never, it's usually what Satan's attacks are, are just like a we're going to start turning the boat slowly this way, and eventually, before they know it, they're going to be pointing the, the complete opposite direction. And so, you know, especially in this chapter, it brings up that Paul is instituting elders and leaders to argue, to combat arguments that are coming against these Christian communities, right? And it had to be in a personal way, because Paul's not going to be there. What Paul and Barnabas and the other apostles are starting they're going to go plant more churches, and they can't stay there. So they need to raise up people to argue, right, to combat, to combat uh, unhealthy doctrine, right? And you can see that in, especially with the uh, first and second letter to Timothy, where he's saying don't be contentious, but don't allow people to go down these endless lists of genealogies and, and, and things that eventually bring people away from the grace of God, right? And so... Um, Especially in 1 Timothy 4.13, he says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Right? That's what we need. That's what we hopefully come to church for, or at least one of the things we come to church for on Sunday mornings, is to get exhortation, to get healthy doctrine, to be led in the right direction. Right? But it's supposed to be a way of life. Right? That's what we, that's what we need. That's what, how Paul has instituted teachers... Um, um, to, to guide us in that direction. And so, so as we come to the table, you know, as we're called to be a Christian community where we actively want to plant more Christian communities, we're trying to be the model church that God wants us to be so that we can send out leaders who will plant more Christian communities. What we do in communion is we come to the table for grace to do what, what God's called us to do. And so... Um, as Acts 3 uh, was saying that, that Christ must be retained or must be received into heaven until the restoration of all things, we come here on a weekly basis to take part in God's grace so that we may go back out and do the work he's called us to. And so um, as we come up, let's uh, partake in God's grace and, and dine with him.